control of listeria and salmonella biofilms in the food chain, it, it's really going to be a history of where we were and where we are now and perhaps some lessons that we've learned along the, uh, the, the chain and, and what needs further to be done. So two starting pictures. The one on the, the left was taken by uh, a colleague of mine, Roy Betts at Camden, and the one on the right was by myself in, in the, the mid 80s. And they just demonstrated that um, microorganisms would attach to stainless steel and their cleanability was controlled a little bit by the surface roughness. And it's 1985, and this is the first time the food industry have a recognition that microorganisms can be found on surfaces in the sense of being attached there. We've always recognized that bugs are on surfaces simply because we've always swabbed after cleaning and disinfection and found them. But this was the first concept of, of microbial attachment, and it's 1985. So the the history of biofilms in the food industry is really not that not that old. Um, a little bit of, of, of thought processes at the time and were the microorganisms that you found on the surface related to the food um, or were they related to actually being present on the surface and, and growing as a com community of their own right? So early studies were done with uh, stainless steel coupons put on food factory surfaces, taken out uh, back to the, uh, the lab and using acridine orange as a, as a method to detect what was on the surface. And uh, we had very mixed differences. We, we had on the right, uh, much debris orientated, on the left, um, again, covering with, with, with uh, in this case, a, a glaze, but also microorganisms within the glaze. We did know at the time that there was a relationship between cleaning and microbial content of, uh, of the surface and of the food. And you could undertake a clean and the level of bacteria on the surface pretty much got back to where it started from very quickly and stayed constant. The only chance uh, potentially of, of the, that, not that equilibrium increasing would be due to growth and ostensibly factories were controlled by temperature or, or the presence of water and that might have restricted uh, microbial growth on surfaces. Primarily our studies at the time were in the ready to eat sector because again in the late 90s listeria uh, raised its ugly head and people were concerned from from even the 90s um, about whether there was a consequence of this organism growing on the surface and an infected product so we have this relationship that the surface microbiology mirrors the product microbiology and then later studies by a colleague of mine, Deb Smith, was suggesting that approximately 50% of organisms on one surface would be transferred to the, the contact surface and vice versa. So if you had a, a food product that was running at 10 to the 5, then pretty much the, the surface relatively quickly was running at 10 to the 5 as well. We have a relationship between cleaning and uh, not cleaning, the presence of biofilm, not presence of biofilm, and also ready to eat um, high hygiene, high risk premises and low risk premises. So this was uh, one of the classic studies that we did, which was a, a P operation. And in the top left hand picture, we have a blancher, which is running at over 90 degrees. The P's coming out there are pretty sterile. 25 meters later, they're in a pack and they have a count of 10 to the 6 per gram. Those have been picked up from a surface. When you look at the surface, it is a microbial community. But when you look at cleaning, they're probably um, the, the pea season typically runs for about six weeks. And maybe once a day, there will be a hose, uh, a hose down uh, to take gross uh, material away rather than the full uh, cleaning and disinfection program. 
And again, this was raw materials. And again, the thought at this time was a pea is a raw material. It's going to be cooked. We're not really so concerned about the microbiology of it at that time. Um, concept of pathogens on a surface really started here, which was a buttermilk operation. And we did see growth of organisms on the surface and it was identified as Staph aureus. And because Staph aureus grows uh, and when it divides tends to stay together, you, you got blocks of, of, of two and four and eight and 16 uh, Staph aureus and you could see those developing on, on the surface. So again, early on, we had the concept that we might have uh, pathogens growing on food contact surfaces. This slide was about 1990 and really tried to sum up where we are uh, with, with, uh, with, with biofilms. And it was the concept that there was an initial attachment. And when we, when we started down the biofilm route, there was a concept of, of reversal on a surface and uh, initial attachment was fairly weak. Then you went through a colonization stage, which was probably between two and 24 to 48 hours, where there was attachment and a change of the physiology of the cells. And then ultimately you got this climax community. And the term biofilm at the time referred to this uh, climax community. These sort of sections were attached cells. So again, in the early days, this was seen as a, as, a, as a biofilm. This was seen as attached cells. And if you undertook cleaning within uh, a 24 hour period, you were left with attached cells on a surface. And uh, we still have, I think, a problem with a, with a definition. Is this a biofilm, the, the colonization stage? Or does it only refer to, to a climax community? And, and is attached cells a better definition of what we routinely find, particularly on ready to eat uh, food surfaces? So the implications, um, uh, and we're going back to the, to the early 90s, microorganisms can uh, adhere to, to the surfaces and the removal is, is hygienically design based. Um, there is deposition, there is growth. Biofilms per se are only a concern to ready to eat foods. In, in other words, raw materials are, are not seen as, as a particular problem in those days. They are cleaning dependent. Um, we have this concept of what is or what is not a definition. We understood that we could control microbial growth on surfaces by environmental te temperature and water. Uh, more interesting at the time, of the, the early 90s, we started modeling microbial growth in products as part of a concept of, of shelf life. To this date, we have been very poor in modeling the growth of microorganisms on surfaces and hence uh, how you can control microbial growth up, uh, within a factory. Pathogens can, can be uh, present, etc. Beautiful talk by Rob on metagenomics. Uh, this is how it appeared in the, the early 90s. Um, and it was a concept of, of persistence, whether the organisms were there all of the time in, in, uh, on those surfaces. And the idea was uh, you had a, in, on the top left a yellow bug, a, a red bug you cleaned and uh, a yellow bug survived. It was joined by a green bug the next day, it was cleaned and then it was a, a red and blue. It was completely random. And below in terms of it, uh, persistence, if we were thinking of persistence, we have a, a yellow and a red bug that is the community and its levels go up and down with cleaning. Occasionally it might be joined by some, some other bug, but that doesn't survive very long. So. Again, we, we, we were beginning to think of the concepts of, of persistence, and, and, uh, but at those days, we only had traditional ma uh, microbiology tools to look at this rather than these, uh, the situation that Rob is in uh, today. Early factory studies, um, we went out and we were doing a, a couple of hundred thousand samples and using ribotyping at, at that time, there was a suggestion that uh, you found quite a few isolates of mono, but they were only in 19 uh, 
ribogroups, whereas pseudomonads and staph, virtually as many ribogroups as there were isolates. So what, again, was there some concept of, of persistence within, uh, within mono um, because there were fewer uh, ribogroups? Isolation rates, Karen uh, talked a little about uh, uh, this and I'll come back to it, uh, to it later. The, the first isolation rates that we found for mono um, were, were fairly low in, in product. Again, when ribotyping was, was first developed, very quickly after that, we found um, 47 strains of mono. What does that mean? Does that mean that there were certain strains that uh, lived well in the food um, but couldn't grow on surfaces? Um, and vice versa, when, when those organisms on surfaces were in the food, they, they, their growth was poor, uh, but the foodborne organisms was, was good. Um, and then was there any indication that the organisms on the, on the, the surface or in the food were the organisms that were virulent in, in patients in hospitals? We had some concept of, of ribogroups in surfaces and food, but any work on, on hospital uh, related cases was not undertaken at that time. But there was a, a concept here of is, is there any tracing of, of a strain from being on a biofilm through, through a food to, to a patient? And it was also the concept that to make a lot of people ill, you needed to have lots of growth of microorganisms on a surface, infecting lots of individual uh, bits of product, growing in the product to an infective dose, and then making uh, a lot of people uh, a lot of people ill through an infective dose. So it was trying to understand a little bit about how people ultimately uh, succumb to a to a pathogen. There was some evidence from the early studies uh, in the, the environment product column that some strains uh, via ribogroup could live within the environment and, and were found in the product. But there were other strains that were only found in the, uh, uh, in the environment and never found in the product. We tried to take that a little bit further and, and, and try and establish persistence. But, it, but the, the number of listeria that we were finding was so low that it was very difficult to do that. So for example, in factory one, we found one, this uh, riba group 102195S1, once in, in the environment of low risk, um, a couple of times in the environment of high risk, 18 times in product. Uh, does that mean that the organism started from low risk and came across, or is it pr predominantly in high risk? Um, we found this one, this S3 strain, only in high risk in this one factory, but it, it was difficult to, to draw conclusions. At the same time, there was a, a we're now into uh, early 2000s, there was a paper published that suggested that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that you, you could find the same strains of organisms in the local community as in the food factory. So here was the local community um, infecting the food factory or the food factory infecting the local community. Is persistence genuinely organisms growing and persisting in the factory or is it simply uh, walked in the factory on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and simply by going in and sampling a factory once and then two months later and then two months later and finding the same organism, does that tell you that it's persistent or simply uh, it was there when you sampled it? Um, salmonella, uh, less of, a, of an issue in the early days than, than listeria, but this was the, the, the case that changed everything. It was a multi-meal factory, uh, 1998, salmonella agona um, in these products. 10 years later, the same strain was found uh, in the product. And the concept here was that the, uh, the organism Salmonella had survived within a concrete wall. The concrete wall had been disturbed 10 years later, the building dust had got into the product and therefore we, we had a, a, an issue. Uh, one of my uh, PhD students su subsequently, uh, Ditta Margas, had a look at this and found that time per se on many 
strains of salmonella is not a control of long-term uh, survivability. So essentially, if you get a survival uh, salmonella in a plant, um, in a dry plant, it is survival and may survive for years. If it's listeria in a wet plant, is the concept of, of persistence. So many implications then, and we're now in the early 2000s, many strains of listeria. Uh, what does that mean? Is there a potential of persistence? Um, is there the, the influence of the environment around the factory? Where is these organisms coming from? Um, the relationship between growth in the environment and the product shelf life and virulence, is it the same strain? Can you demonstrate it? What would that strain have to, to be able to uh, to uh, do well in all of those three scenarios. Toxins was a, an interesting one. There was some concept that uh, could a, a biofilm create, uh, organisms growing in a biofilm create a toxin on the surface, which was then transferred into the food. Um, and that really died a death. Very little happened with, with that through lack of evidence, I guess. Um, and then the concept of, of survival and persistence is keeping these organisms um, uh, going for, for longer periods of, of, of time. Karen has, has already shared this, so I'll just be very, uh, very quick. Um, there, you read some biofilm uh, publications and there is the concept that uh, listeria, salmonella are living in these biofilms. Uh, they're out of control. Lots of people um, are, are, are ill through it and we're creating problems. That's not the case. That I don't want to belittle this, but in essence, 2,000 cases of listeria in Europe, and Europe currently has a population of about 740 million, um, it is a low level risk. We have to take, take it serious. But the concept that out there every day in our factories, there's listeria on surfaces and we're in trouble is, is taking it a little far. Um, again, Karen shared some data. Um, from the early days, there was always a suggestion that a fully cooked product, best practice for listeria, uh, mono contamination was, was about 0.1%. If it was high care, so if it, uh, if it was a, a sandwich that, that might have had some uh, produce in it, it might be a little higher. Um, earlier data from, from Caring going back a bit suggested her database was about 1%. Uh, I was uh, encouraged to see that it was 0.7 now. Fantastic, that means it's going, it's going down. But these are low um, and again, uh, you have a concept where going down a production line, one in every 200 packs might contain one listeria, and one in every 200,000 packs might contain more than one, a countable number of listeria. So really the industry is pretty much in control, although obviously we, there are some issues and I'll, I'll come back to it. Again, the table here, just uh, the, the European alerts and the U UK FSA uh, situation. Um, there are problems, um, but there's not huge quantities. My interest at the moment is, is the number of listeria incidents and, and alerts in Europe. COVID has uh, devastated many parts of the industry. But the reality at the moment is we're using more disinfectants and hand hygiene products than we ever have. So the hygiene in the food industry is at the moment to control COVID is much higher than it ever has been. Does that have any implications on, on pathogens? So if, if you're more hygienic in the factory, is there less incidence of, of pathogens in food? Maybe. Uh, maybe the, 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 the lower levels might suggest it. Salmonella is higher in 2020, primarily th through things like Brazil nut cases that we had this year, which, which aren't linked to factory hygiene necessarily. Um, moving on, we then learnt that um, growth of organisms before a HACCP CCP, like washing, can give problems. Um, and that was the Jensen Farm cantaloupes. Cross-contamination after CCP, in this case, a, a thermal process, 
uh, can give problems. This is um, a hygienic design of a slicer, allowing all, um, a listeria to grow in the slicer and contamination. So the consequences of biofilms giving rise to potentially areas in which pathogens could grow in a low risk environment started really with, with the cantaloupes because it then suggested that the level of growth of the organism um, on dirty equipment prior to it was so high that any subsequent CCP, in this case washing, couldn't control it. Uh, whole genome sequencing, that's, that has been a big uh, help in identifying particular strains across countries, identifying clusters, etc. But really now saying that there's nowhere to hide and we will detect um, a, a strain in a product and your, your factory. So Listeria particularly and Salmonella can cross-contaminate foods pre or post. So now we're beginning to see that biofilms or, or survival of, of pathogens in biofilms in raw materials can have an effect if the CCP is not a strong CCP. It's not a pasteurization, it's simply a washing one. Um, Cross-contamination rates are low and, and numbers are low in product, but they're still there. We have to be um, cautious about it. Cleaning is very successful. Uh, the, uh, what we have done to, to manage uh, cleaning and uh, better hygienic design of food processing surfaces, and this was a, the picture on the top right here is, is maple leaf foods and the concept of if you can't dismantle, you can't, de, uh, you can't break it down to clean, put it in a plastic bag, fill it with steam, heat it up to 70 degrees and control it that way. So uh, we've had a little bit of, of uh, uh, a change in the way that we're doing and a practical control. Pathogen control philosophy. This came in in about 2010. It was uh, something that originated at Camden and uh, I'm still working with this through, through Holchem. And it's the idea that you've got four little segments, stop the, uh, the pathogens getting into your high hygiene environment, uh, restrict their growth, don't allow any sources, manage the, the cross-contamination risk through, through vectors and use a, a hygiene procedure to uh, uh, remove uh, as many organisms that, that, as you can at that particular hygiene interface. Managed by a team, technical look after the barriers, engineering the infrastructure, production all the vectors, hygiene pick up the, the, the hygiene processes. And then the, the center is the fifth aspect of, of creating an environmental sampling program that picks up and manages, ensures the uh, monitoring and verification of all the controls that you put in place on those, those four sectors. There is no magic bullet. It has to be a, a teamwork approach. We can look at uh, microorganisms, uh, Listeria uh, primarily, but Salmonera as well. If we look at it, we have to look at, take a seasonal approach. Um, there is a seasonal approach with listeria in product. We first saw it in salmon, uh, where there is higher counts in, in um, the latter summer months. But because it's an environmental organism, uh, you get greater challenges in the summer months as well. Therefore, your barriers to try and stop uh, listeria coming in on soil or dust into the factory have to be very strong in the summer months. We also begin to see little uh, product issues. Um, this tends to, to be reflective of, of produce and in the early part of the year the produce might be coming from Africa or southern Europe. Uh, in the middle part of the year it might be UK, uh, UK grown etc. And listeria levels tend to rise within that product at the at, towards the end of the, the growing season. Um, so we see spikes with, with different uh, sourcing of, of products. And we can also see that uh, occasionally where um, in something like smoked salmon, um, where the salmon could be sourced from different, um, different cages, different suppliers, et cetera. And again, it can give us some peaks. Our biggest issue at the moment is drains. And a drain is a connection from the inside of a high-risk food factory to the sewer. 
and is is almost uncontrollable. Um, by law, you have to control gases, foul air gases, so you have uh, baffles in simple uh, situations like that. But you cannot get down these pipes and uh, clean and disinfect in, in here. We know listeria can be associated with drains. We don't really have any control options. We have better drain designs now where the foul air trap is part of a, the, the structure in a gasket. And now there isn't a direct line uh, through the, the drain and into the factory floor. But again, we can't at the moment control uh, biofilms within this, uh, this zone here. Uh, sources, the, if I'm looking in a factory these days, this is what I look for. Um, I'm looking for any leakage out of structures. And uh, this is water leakage out from between the, the bottom of a wall and a curb. Often you find listeria here. We can't control it. I can spray this area of the floor where it's wet every two hours, uh, knapsack sprayer, etc. But I cannot get to the source of that listeria. So I, I can do a little bit, but I can't find my sources. Uh, I can't uh, control sources in that way. And similarly, if I'm talking about deep inside a piece of equipment, it's sometimes difficult to get into that source of, of, uh, of listeria. Others I can do. So this is one of the classics. This is uh, a concept here of a drain that uh, is loosely into the into the floor you press on the drain it squirts uh listeria out because water is is down the sides of that i can by better building design uh, make the drain firmly attached to the floor anchor the surfaces put some mastic between um i i hygienic design the european hygiene engineer design group have come on an awful long way uh, since since uh, 2000 or so in coming up with structures that don't move or have control movements if the structure doesn't move it doesn't break you don't get the floor breakages you don't get the areas where the listeria can be sources uh, occasionally um, we see persistence and we see persistence in in the sense that every time we sample in an area predominantly it's innocua or it's mono um, sometimes its numbers go up and down, which might be reflective of, of deep cleaning. We believe that this is persistence. Uh, we're still not convinced that it isn't uh, moving in of, of listeria from low risk on a day-to-day -day basis. But this is just indicating that there are patterns, even in a persistent organism, its movements go up and down. So it's sometimes difficult to, to recognize whether that is a, a genuinely persistent organism. Biofilms do exist, particularly where they are difficult to clean or there are uh, poor hygienic designs. And this is a strip, the bottom left hand side is the strip down of a piece of equipment. When we get into the framework, we can find uh, a film. This is underneath a trolley wheel, this is underneath a piece of equipment. So, genuinely, we do get biofilms in the food industry where you can't clean. Um, I think Jean Yves is going to talk a little later today about dr potential for dry surfaces um, and, and, and growth on those wet surfaces. Uh, we do we we have a number of, of niches. Um, clean surfaces we don't think is an issue. Uh, hygienic dead zones that you can uh, strip down, like the the slicing machines in maple leaf, once a week or so, and do something. But really, our, our, our worry is wet, unclean surfaces, that, particularly those that we can't access. Um, vectors, this is a classic one. This is a, 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 an oven. The oven is, is not well sealed to the floor. We know list area is in the interface between the oven and the surface. It comes out, it gets on the floor. Uh, now we've got this trolley here. This is the initial packaging. The packaging is touching the floor. I've now transferred listeria uh, from this area onto the packaging, onto, the, my, onto my food. So we could do a little more sometimes in managing uh, known isolation areas and, and stopping access to them. 
But that list area in, in underneath that floor is going to stay there for a long time. Uh, economically, to, to change that oven is going to be very expensive uh, to do. Hands, this is an interesting one. There is the concept now that food operators' hands, particularly those that are touching raw materials, carry uh, listeria. Uh, or other pathogens, whereas people who don't work in the food industry don't carry pathogens on their hands. We, I, I see little work on biofilms associated with skin and whether there, is, uh, there can be the penetration of pathogens into, into skin microflora uh, and, and persist there. Hygiene technologies, uh, you read a lot of uh, uh, articles these days and, and, and you get uh, nice pictures like this with different uh, sources. And I just want to try and put some of this into perspective. Again, Karen had talked a little bit about the biocidal product regulations. With my chemical manufacturer hat on, just as, as an example, if I wanted to look at farges and make antibacterial claims, legally, I can only use a farge if it is part of something called Annex 95 so that it is a registered uh, biocidal active agent. And I need to put that into a formulated product. I need to submit dossiers to uh, the European Commission or, or pro, po, I did post uh, pre-Brexit. The, the situation isn't entirely clear post-Brexit. It's gonna cost me anywhere between 500 to 100,000 to a million pounds to go through that exercise. So if somebody is going to suggest to me that why don't, why aren't, uh, why don't I take uh, phages a little bit further or bacteriosins, et cetera, I'm going to have to sell um, 10 million pounds worth of that uh, on a basic profit margin of 10% to recover the million that I've spent on registering that product. The whole market for cleaning and disinfectant products in the UK is probably about a, an annual of 120 million. So you're talking about creating a product to take 10% of the marketplace to pay back the investiture that I've made into this. So we would have to be very clear that there was a market for a, a development of a new chemical. So Enzymes, biosurfactants, signaling systems may uh, well be developed because they wouldn't make killing claims, but they would make removal claims from a surface. And that's acceptable. Um, competitive exclusion is, is something else. Can you uh, put other microorganisms, can you uh, build on Rob's uh, pictures of, of the microbiome and, and can you make that a competitive? competitive uh, exclusion place. So last, last one really, and again, showing my age a little bit here, and I go back to uh, uh, Monty Python. Uh, what did the Romans ever do for us? And, and taking that forward as a, what did the biofilm community ever, ever do for us? Where do I think we, we now need some, uh, some work? Um, in terms of raw materials coming into our factories, we know that listeria is more likely to be in produce when it rains. If the produce is grown near woods, near water, near roads, we don't know why. Is there anything related to biofilms in the field that might control where a, a, a raw material is sourced from in the environment? On-farm processing practices, again, the little attention is, is on there. But there is the recognition now that, that if there were biofilms present on those that allowed pathogens to grow in them to a level that subsequently a washing stage couldn't control, that would give us problems. Uh, within the food processing environment, hygienic design, cleaning frequencies, we've done that since 1985. We're, uh, uh, the situation is slowly improving, but we're in a, a, a pretty good place. Has anything happened since 1985 really to change the way that we clean and disinfect? No, there's been no new systems that targeted against biofilms. What would I like? I would like something that would kill a biofilm or remove pathogens from it far away, far away being down a drain. 
uh, that would be great. That would stop those organisms coming into my higher hygiene areas. I would like to be able to target known sources. So can you get something that will penetrate into a wall or a crevice and then disrupt the biofilm or again, change the ability for a pathogen to be held there? And skin, uh, there really has been very little uh, information on, on uh, pathogens in the skin and whether particular, um, uh, particular jobs within the food industry lead to the development of pathogens in that basis. We still don't understand persistence and, and hopefully uh, some of the, the work maybe on molecular biology will uh, give us a basis of persistence. What should a, a, a microorganism that was in a factory 10 years ago, what should that microorganism look like now through natural mutations, et cetera, is that evidence that it stayed in the, in the, the food environment? Um, growth on surfaces, that would be great, particularly on the dry food side. If I could wet clean a factory and know that uh, if I did it with two or three hours, that has no implication on the organisms that were there. It doesn't make them grow. That would be fantastic. Um, and this concept of persistence, product growth, virulence, super organisms, how can you detect whether you have one of those in your plant, which potentially might be uh, uh, your biggest worry. So thank you very much. Many thanks, John. That was a really uh, stimulating presentation and lots of questions for us in the biofilm research community as to how we do things better. Um, I have plenty of questions, but I'm going to pass it over to you because I see there are lots in the, in the Q&A. So, Will, if you have any questions for John, I think we have time for one, maybe. I think you're on mute there, Will. Yeah, you're on mute, William. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so we have a, a question that's coming from uh, Jeff Banks, who asks, in, in your opinion, what are the most concerning sequence types of Listeria monocytogenes uh, that are found in biofilm? I, I'm sorry, Will, you, you cut off on the end. All I got was uh, okay. sequence types. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in your opinion, what are the most concerning sequence types of LM that are found in biofilms? I don't know, Jeff. Uh, to be honest, uh, I, I I think in a practical control sense, I I'm more interested in in trying to get it all strains out. Um, if if you're suggesting that there might be particular sequences that, that make an organ uh, make a, a strain of listeria more able to remain within that biofilm uh, and and resist treatments to 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 get rid of it that would be my major concern, but whether that occurs or not, I, I don't know. 